Live again, it's day three and Rescue Dogs Online Summit. And this evening, we're going to focus a bit more about training and helping your rescue dogs and the thing and the activities that you can do. And the first session tonight, we're welcoming Trish. Hi, Trish, how are you? Hi. <laughs> are you good? Yeah. Yes, good. Good, good. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk a bit about. Uh, Man trailing and nose work and how those things can help rescue dogs. But first, Trish, can you tell us a bit about more about your background and what you do and how you got into training and, do and the dogs you have and and etc. Right, et <laughs> <laughs> All the dogs. I I was a vet nurse um, many years ago in the eighties. I I was out in Vancouver in Canada, so we were called animal health technicians out there. And when I came back to Ireland in 1986, I didn't get back into vet nursing. So fast forward to 2009, and it seemed like a good idea to go back into vet nursing. I was working with a career coach at the time, and she was saying, you're so passionate about this, you should do it. But um, I, I did a few days with my vet, and I brought home a Jack Russell who had separation anxiety. And I didn't know it existed. I didn't know what it was. I just couldn't understand why this dog had to follow me everywhere. So I did a bit of research and got into the behavior end of things because it just seemed a fascinating journey. We, we never did any of that in, in vet nursing. Um, there was never one module on behavior. So I've ping-ponged around the place with different uh, trainers. I've always been a positive trainer and I've been very lucky in that my love of dogs came from my mum and I never saw her discipline a dog and she allowed me to bring in so many dogs off the street. <laughs> when I look at the dogs that I have now, um, I have, uh, my, my breed is the Belgian Malinois mm -hmm. and I think what I had, what, what was a common crossbreed on the streets in Dublin back then was a German Shepherd Labrador type cross. So I obviously have a, have a thing for that size and breed. Um, mm -hmm. I think my, I'm a Karen Pryor Academy certified training partner. So that would be a speciality in clicker training and capturing and shaping behavior um and i'm very proud of that accreditation it was a great course to do your dog comes along with you and you work together it's it's fantastic i'm also um a man trailing global instructor and that's something i did just prior to lockdown mm. um i have been a family pause parent educator i haven't done that for a long time because i think um I didn't see parents being concerned about the relationship between dogs and children and issues. So I think I'm seeing it now, but maybe I was 10 years too early. I brought that program to the UK 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I am a trustee and behavior advisor for Bedlington Terrier Rescue here in the UK. Oh, okay. Okay, great. And you mentioned near man trailing. Can you talk a bit about that and how it can, you know, potentially help rescue dogs as well, probably any dog, but especially rescues as well, because that's kind of our subject here. Yeah. Um, so I've had, I've spent, I'd say the last 12 years working with reactive dogs. It seems to be the thing I got into. And I went along to, um, a man trailing session with my disc dog club, not really knowing what it was about and thinking I probably can't participate because Maddie, my my then six year old Malinoir was was a reactive dog. She didn't particularly like humans, but she really hated dogs. And we thought, well, we'll see if we can if we can give it a go. And we we actually I mean, my thing was if she looks uncomfortable at any stage, we're bailing, we're not going to do it. And she did it and did really well. And I was so surprised. And I did a few more sessions and I could see the benefits with Maddie. So I enrolled in the instructor's program. So when we're talking about the, the 
benefits of man trailing. Um, and I think for a rescue dog, you don't want to be out there doing stuff in the first six weeks. Yeah. You know, you need that bedding in time and you need to build a bond and understand what your dog's needs are. But the, the beauty of man trailing is um, there are there's very little verbalization. Your dog. So basically, it's it's what we see operationally is search and rescue and man trailing is that premise as a as a sport. So mm-hmm. your your dog has a scent item left by a specific person. That person goes away and hides with something really enriching to the dog: food, reward, or toy. I usually have to spell that, but I have a different dog in the room with me right now. Yeah. Um, so that that the the dog follows that human scent and gets their reward. And we can tailor it to all kinds of dogs. I've trailed blind dogs, amputee dogs, um, deaf dogs. They they all succeed at it. And from a handler point of view, you follow your dog on a long line. The long line is really for public and community safety. It's so that we're not out in woodland with a loose dog. Um, but it's it's really nice for the handler because they at some stage during the trail, they're following along and they just turn and they and I'm behind them as an instructor and they just smile like look at what my dog is doing it's brilliant there's no urging there's no instruction there's no definitely no correction and the what happens afterwards is the the confidence building so your dog does something that is not high arousal but is really satisfying enriching using their brain and their olfactory system yeah. and they get that lovely serotonin release and all those calming hormones which is nice they all sleep mm. like crazy on the way home as soon as they're in the car they're asleep and we work one dog at a time okay so the 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 everybody understands at the start that the dogs rest in the car unless they're trailing okay okay so from that point of view, so what, what, what I started to notice was Maddie's feelings about people were changing. Okay. And there's nothing she did except she was trailing. She found a missing person. And in the early days, I would say to people, just put the pot of food down, stand back. Don't interact with her. Don't touch her. We're so far past that now. She will pick random people out in the crowd and bring her toy to them. Now, they are still, everybody is still told for for Maddie, don't stroke her on the head. She doesn't like it. But if she brings the toy, you can throw it back to her. Yeah, okay. So that's where the change has happened. And I wasn't prepared. I wasn't told you'll see this. This was something that just happened. And I said, wow, this is absolutely brilliant. So, How long did it take, if you remember? For for the change? Yeah. I'd say we were probably two months in when I said, this is different. <laughs> it's just because when we started, um, she would grab the lead mm-hmm. with arousal. And um, compared to other dogs who hadn't done a lot of stuff, I've done a lot of trick dog stuff and I've done a lot of training. So there are two cues at the start of man trailing, sniff and trail. And mm-hmm. that's it. And so they sniff their scented item and they trail. And she would look at me and she'd throw everything in. She'd do her spin. She'd do peekaboo. She would do downs. And she just didn't know in the beginning what I wanted from her. And then in frustration, she would grab the lead and haul on the lead. And now I pack up the food containers in the house and she's up. We're going working. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was, yeah, it, it was a funny thing because not having been told this and to see it happen and see the change in her. So it's not that it's really important that people um understand that it's a 
it's a it's a process that happens with a dog it's the solving of a problem the gaining of confidence and what that does for a dog mm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And you talk a bit, I mean, man trailing is kind of like nose work, but I know there's also other like scent games and stuff that you can do as well that would really help rescue dogs and that anybody really could do at home. Could yeah. you talk a bit about that, like give a few examples of activities that people could do, you know? Yep. Um, just even if you're you're just going to base it in the house or the back garden, um all of those, there, there are some lovely Facebook groups and and um, Sarah Fisher here in the UK with her ACE program, ACE is the group on Facebook. Absolutely brilliant. And even, I mean, I'm constantly collecting the, the cardboard inserts of toilet rolls to stuff with newspaper and bits of kibble and treats. There, there are so many options. Um, I'm sure people know about snuffle mats and licky mats and all of those things. But also, um, I have a dry stone wall in my back garden that's about 100 feet long because I live in Yorkshire. There's, there's dry stone walls everywhere. And I put squeezy cheese in the crevices of the dry stone wall. Uh, we have a very noisy dog next door and he kicks off every time we go out. So... I go ahead with the squeezy cheese and it offsets that for my dogs. It stops that interaction. Right. So just that that seeking behavior to get a dog using the seeking part of their brain and to work independently. Mm -hmm. You know, we're still there. We're still part of the picture. But I think we live in a world of very over verbalizing for dogs where we do a lot of management and correction and over here, do this. Do. <laughs> it, it, it can be a bit of an overwhelm. So scent work and nose work are, are fantastic. And again, for that, um, the opposite of the arousal sports where they're getting cortisol and adrenaline just to get those those calming mm. hormones is, is, is a really nice activity. Yeah. And you can decide the duration. It can be short, it can be long, it can be a five minute search, it can be, you know, one minute search. It's it's applicable everywhere too. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, like coming back to rescue dogs, what are the main like issues that you notice? I know you work with a particular breed there, but uh, yeah, can you tell us a bit about the main issues that you see with them? I know there's probably a lot, but... <laughs> <laughs> so in in terms of um the dogs because i'm working with a breed specific rescue we we very much know the characteristics of the breed and we will know in the main what we're dealing with um uh you know bedlingtons are terriers but we don't see a lot of working lines in them anymore we see more uh, a mix of show and working um but in terms of, of the applications that we have for the dogs, we tend to have applicants who've had a Betty in the past and they they want to stick with the breed. What, where we see a lot of need for education is the expectations people have now, where um, I suppose there's there's quite a lot of... I suppose it's been brought around by um, social media and all of the TikTok stuff and, you know, loving dogs is enough. Um, and, and you can get through everything and the physicality of interaction with dogs. Um, there's a lot of that. And you know yourself, we, we, we know that dogs don't always want hugs and cuddles and things. And for, for us as a rescue, we do a lot of work on the intake assessment and on getting to know the dog. So we will have a very specific plan to work to. We may have diet um, supplements and we may have a specific diet for the dog to be on. And we may have behavior issues to address. And we put people in place who look after all of that. But in return, we really want people who will stick to the plan. Um, we're very, very big on that um, decompression period. 
you know that. <laughs> Nobody can talk about it because I know, but I'm not sure that the audience knows. So, so, <laughs> so for for a dog who is in um in that transfer stage, they've lost everything that they've had as security. And they have they may have been in in an intermediary situation where they're in a foster home. Um, they may have been in the pound. Now, we don't have that, but I, I've also spoken to rescues who do have it and I know what their situation is. And two of my dogs have have been from that situation. Um, Puck, who's here beside me, who's who's a Mali, he was six months in kennels and he was strayed at, at four months. So initially with him, um, thank goodness he was a good sleeper because, oh boy, <laughs> it was, it was tough going. So the, what our, what our guidelines would be, and it doesn't matter that we're um, a breed specific rescue, this would be transferable to every rescue is that when you take, when you're matched up with the dog and it's suitable for you, your lifestyle, your family, everybody's on board, that the first at least a week, hopefully more, will be very easy going, tootling in and out, no walks. And that's so difficult. You know, there's a lot of excitement and people want to get out and they want their dog to meet this person yeah. and that person. But that period of bedding in for that dog is so important. And to go back to the... Um, the scent work and all of that work that I do in man training. When a dog comes to a new home, the scent, the scents that he will be using mostly will be olfactory, taking in those scents, mapping out the house and figuring out what's what. And you have routines that you've put in for ages that your dog doesn't know. So you've got to give them time to get used to that. And it is, we, we have this terrible compulsion to do walks, put equipment on a dog and do walks. And we've got to just slow that all down and stay home. Um, stay home and just do that, that, that short little period, you know, where you just let that dog bed in and settle in and get to know what their likes and dislikes are. Yeah. 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 Can you talk a bit more about I don't know, the different phases, because we always say, you know, uh, the tree, tree, tree rule, you know, the three days, yeah. three weeks, three months. Can you talk a bit about that? Because I don't know, I don't think anybody else would mention that. So I'm taking the chance here. Well, it is the, so um, in terms of education, and <clears throat> we, we will probably talk about this later, that, that we have, um, uh produced our own training program for for our, our foster carers and um one of the the well one of the the talks that that i did was specifically on stress um i had a dog who i brought from the uk or from from ireland to the uk with me shelby was a collie who when i took her on in rescue um she weighed six, six kilograms, seven kilograms, and she, she was just close to death. She was the most shut down dog I've ever seen. Um, and when I was talking about stress and the condition that she was in when I took her on, um, she blossomed. She did really well. She came to join a Jack Russell. But um, even for me, with the knowledge that I had, I didn't plan on bringing her home the day I did. And I had nothing set up. Mm -hmm. So something that I would not encourage people to do. But I couldn't leave her in the situation she was in because the kennel was overwhelming for her. And I knew she wasn't going to make her make it. I took her to my vet on the way home and he didn't think she'd make it. Um, so we just we we got her home and um, she joined a Jack Russell who was not expecting a collie to join her that day. But Ruby, my Jack Russell, was very laid back and they they were hugely bonded all of their lives together. 
but it's it's not the way to do it but i could step in and and change things and make things work so mm-hmm. it you know it 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 worked out okay but her life would have been cut short by that stress and it was extreme stress that caused her condition she was just overwhelmed couldn't deal she's a she was a very gentle dog just couldn't deal with these other dogs who were they weren't kenneled so they were all free and there were numbers that she just couldn't deal with and she had um, advanced heart disease at 10 years of age um, my vet figured it was from that emaciation stage that she went through and it shortened her life. So stress is a huge, huge thing. Um, she was signaling it. She The shutdown mm-hmm. is emotionally, I can't cope anymore. So she was signaling it. But um, they they d- just didn't really know enough to to understand that. And, and when you're dealing with numbers of dogs, that can happen. Mm-hmm. So um, dealing with the stress end of things, if a dog gets if you don't understand the signals and you don't understand the body language and you don't know what's going on, it can get to a stage where they'll either choose shut down or they'll react in a different way. And it may be they'll have triggers during the day and it's the 10th episode of being hugged by the child in the house where, where something happens. So the, all of those things need to be taken into consideration um and i think i've gone a bit off script <laughs> you asked me the question again we, we talk we're talking about body language which is great because we'll have a session about that because yeah, it's so very important to be able to like like read your dog's body language and one they're trying to tell you because that's how you yeah. can avoid accidents and realize if they're stress or not and yeah so we'll have that massive uh talk tomorrow which i'm very happy about because a lot of owners have no clue so uh yeah so it's, it's very important definitely yeah uh, yeah and and i think you know there's there's a huge amount of work that goes into taking on the puppy and there's massive preparation i mean just imagine anybody you see at a pet store and they're gathering up all of the stuff and the person behind the till says oh are you getting a new puppy and there's a lot of work and people are told about it and then in in terms of a rescue dog sometimes there is a lack of understanding if they're taking on an adult dog that they're that this dog has had experiences and will bring not not so much we don't focus on baggage but they will have a way of dealing with things that that um you need to put exactly the same amount of work in you need to plan where you're going to go for your dog training but not until you've done that decompression period yeah. <laughs> way down the road yeah. um but yeah you, you, you and i sometimes see um some of our adopters would have well especially if they've had the breed before but also if they've always had dogs and their expectation will sometimes be this is an adult dog they've been in the world long enough so they've learned yeah. therefore they should come with this knowledge, this knowledge, this knowledge. And we just can't work off that. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people also sometimes expect, yeah, it's an adult dog, so it should be trained, should be toilet trained, should be everything. And no, it's not the case because you have to remember that your dog likes what is completely changed. And he yes. doesn't know you and he doesn't know how to access food. He doesn't understand you. He doesn't know where the toilet is. And it's I always say to people, it's like, yeah, getting thrown in a country that you don't know with people you don't know and you don't speak the language and you rely on them that's exactly the same same way same thing exactly exactly yeah 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 the the we tend to have expectations around nice behavior Mm. and um we really have to realize that it'll be an ongoing thing sorting things out yeah Absolutely. Yeah, can you talk a bit more about the, the program that you've developed for the Force Trust that you mentioned as well? Yeah. So we the the foster carers end of things, it's 
it's probably one of the most important things that a rescue can have is to have that support from those those foster carers um and, and i i think when people first apply what what they're going to do is maybe they have a resident dog sometimes that doesn't work out or they might be um in a situation where they don't want to commit to a dog right now there are various reasons that they'll apply to be a foster but in the main we found that what they felt they were offering was a home on a temporary basis for a specific dog mm. and sometimes they would request a, a specific dog um and they may go on then to eventually adopt that dog but mm. what where we wanted to look at it was the importance in that fostering role in how those people could um work through a behavior program so that perhaps we had a dog who went into foster with an issue like uh, barking at everybody who came to the front door that they would work with us and resolve issues and work through issues so the chances for adoption for that dog would be greatly increased okay. Okay. and we really wanted them understanding the importance of their role mm. Uh, so signing up with us then became, would you do this instruction program that we've just written? Mm -hmm. And they were all keen. Okay. So, yeah. So we, we did our first weekend um, at here in Huddersfield at premises belong to the university. And they are, they were so big uh, into dogs um, coming into their cafe and walking in the woods that they gave us their lecture hall at a very cheap price. It was great. So we started off well. So we, what we did was the, the, the first thing we, we, we worked through was body language. Mm. And um, that was amazing just to see people saying, Oh, I've seen this before. I've seen this, you know, and it, it, it all clicks into place. And that's hugely important. And we also did, um, we dipped a little bit into, I suppose, the science of learning, how dogs learn, um, operant conditioning, no big scary stuff, but, um, you know, just working through um, scenarios that they would present scenarios and we'd, we'd work through what a, what a training plan would be. I gave the talk on stress and the implications for dogs through their life and what it had done to Shelby. And um, just the, the, the importance of understanding what goes on in, in a dog's life on a day-to-day -day basis. We worked through a day, we looked at probable um, issues, outcomes, diet, uh, everything. Yeah, routine. <laughs> yeah. No, because a lot of people don't know about it. That's why I'm talking about it. Because, yeah, like dogs are very routine and they like to know what's going to happen. And if you stick to a very specific routine, your dog will start to feel more confident as well. So but a lot of people don't know that, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny, There, there's... Um, so I often hear my breed described as... Um, not very resilient i would certainly say they're they're not the most resilient of dogs and what what i see often on belgian malinois pages are oh change things up so they never know what to expect and mm -hmm. i thought hell no <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it, i have one dog who she puts herself to bed at eight o'clock every night so imagine if I said, well, let's change that so that she never knows what to expect. And I insisted she did something else. How destructive would that be to her nighttime routine? It would just be terrible. Yeah. It's her routine. She She's the equivalent of a human who gets into their pajamas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and actually, the most resilience comes out of that, doesn't it, Geraldine? That yeah. that you know, her predictability, her feeling of control over her life. Yeah. Yeah. And just knowing what's going to happen, you know. Yeah. She's safe, basically. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, and, and actually that was something too that we spoke about a lot. Um, I'm just remembering that now and it's, it's hugely important choice. Hmm. How we introduce choice, even we, we, we spoke about enrichment games. We looked at the ACE program with Sarah Fisher's um, group and um, just that, that um, changing that, that thing about going for the walk, mm -hmm. introducing your dog to the neighbours, going to the garden centre. You know, dogs are welcome in so many places here. Mm -hmm it can be very detrimental. They're taken to coffee shops where they have to sit under the table for two hours. And it is not dog centric. It's very much the expectation of, of what somebody wants to do. So not for a, a newly rehomed rescue dog. You know, we, we really wanted to talk about these, these issues. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. And we support you know, for, for us, we, we provide the support. Not every rescue has that luxury. But I think the more we're in touch with people and the more we have honesty in the this is how this dog is and what this dog is like. Mm -hmm. This is how this dog copes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, the more chances that dog will stay in the home. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, can you talk about? I know the rescue that you that you work with is in the UK, but can you talk about the different? Like, say people want to adopt a dog. I'm sure you have some requirements because we already talked about that uh, two days ago when we had the talk with the rescue. But I'd like you to talk about it a bit to see if they're similar and so that people can understand as well the reasons behind them you know, why you have such requirements. And because there's a lot of, you know yourself, there's a lot of, you know, people who want to adopt and they think it's going to be easy. And then they're like, oh, no, I tried to adopt a, a dog, but I can't, I don't fit. So it's actually very hard to adopt a rescue. So I just get, get a puppy, you know. So can you talk about the reasons behind all that? Because a lot of people, like, doesn't don't understand really and find it a bit unfair. But, yeah, can you talk about yeah. that? Yeah, well, the, um, the one of the things I and, and I heard it on on your first sessions. One of the things we we hear a lot is this thing about uh, walls and fencing around gardens, and it it really is an obligation to the community at large. We can't allow dogs to roam. It's, it just doesn't happen anymore. And um, the, the, I think the fine here for, for recovery of a stray dog is over 100 pounds and it's there as a deterrent. So on, on a legal um, point of view, you, you can't really rehome a dog without knowing that you have a secure garden. We, we do a lot into, um, th there are important questions. What is your lifestyle? And um, I see a lot, I, I've, so the, the rescue I'm with now wasn't the first rescue I worked with when I came here. I, I, I'm with them because they are so good at what they do. And I worked with a rescue where there was a little bit of um, fudging of dogs behavior issues. And um, we, we were, I suppose at that stage there was there were a lot of, of different breeds. So what happens, I think, in, in a lot of cases, again, it's it's to our detriment, the social media end of things, a picture goes up. And there's a lovely collie called Alfie. And everybody falls in love with this collie in the family and they go and look at him and they, they go and take him home. But he's from working lines and nobody has thought about what it's like living with the working lines collie. So if you go back to that as, as a puppy, how many people set out to get a puppy and say, I think we'll go and get a collie. Let's go and look at one whose parents are working lines and that would really suit us. So it's, it's going about it the wrong way. It really is. But so we ask a lot about lifestyle and, you know, I, I really think I could set up a private detection agency at this stage because you go and you, you get so used to seeing things and understanding things and perhaps, perhaps even seeing things that the um, 
person applying hasn't seen for themselves you mm-hmm. know um for instance um I had a, an application during lockdown and we had to, to work with a video okay. and it was a foster situation. And they said they, re, they lived in a really quiet countryside location in the Peak District and it was all just hills and he'd be up, off doing walks. So in the back of my mind, they well, they, they did say we do five mile walks. So in the back of my mind, I had, you know, the uh, when I go away from that phone call, I will write something down about the walks that need to talk to them about expectations about walks. And it turns out that they lived in a very busy village that was full of tourists. And it was so busy with tourists that it was fully pedestrianized. No cars were allowed into this village. And right by their living room window was the main thoroughfare of tourists. And it was tourists, tourists, tourists. Well, they just lied, basically. What was that? They just lied. No, they didn't actually yes. see Geraldine. Okay. That they didn't see what I could see okay. because in their minds, when they moved there a few years previously to retire, they retired to this sweet little village. Okay. But it has a tourist attraction, which I won't name. Yeah. And it's it's a massive draw there are four car parks just outside the village that fill with tour buses in the summer but in their minds they were in a countryside location and it didn't show up on video at all (laughs) so it worked out just fine um but we had to do a lot of work with this dog we had to um it was a big learning experience for them because they had to use film on their window mm-hmm. are you familiar with that, that look and um you know just just working a, around him living in the back of the house and then moving their office to the back of the house so that they could be with him yeah. um one person was working part time walks were very difficult in the summertime because he went out into just craziness. Mm. Um, but we we did a lot of work. He he the the dog they had he came through it okay. But that application was um, when I eventually went to the house and, and met them and saw their environment. It was completely at odds with the description. And it didn't show up on on, yeah. on video. So yeah. through lockdown, we went through that. But on paper, with their application, it ticked all the boxes. They had the fences. They had the time. They had everything. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, they, they had an electric car. And he spooked like hell with that at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that became a question. Mm-hmm. Um. And and it's it's a funny thing when when I think our our intake uh, form is very thorough, mm-hmm. and it needs to be. And how many people in the house? What is their lifestyle? What are their ages? Some people say not applicable, but <laughs> we do need to know. And and I know from a, an adopter's point of view, it can seem so intrusive. Yeah. But the more we get from you as an adopter or foster the better we are able to say this is the dog that will work with them and they'll all have a great time. It'll, it'll work. And that's the important thing. Nobody wants to give up a dog and no rescue wants to take back a rebound dog. It's hard on everybody. Um, And it's, it's, this is not rescue related, but I had a private behavior client and they were, um, an older couple who had adopted a foreign import rescue dog. And so this was a street dog. And they were, when they phoned me, they were socializing her every day up at the school gates at the local school. And they had been told to do this by the rescue. But the rescue were never available to them. They never heard from them again and they were at their wits end. Mm. This dog was spinning and it had started to self mutilate. Um, And when I started working with them and we removed all of that, 
things were going really well. And then they called me in hysterics one day and said that the dog had gone missing. They were away in their caravan and the dog had jumped through the half door. So like a stable door, the door, and they stayed on that site for two weeks and the dog was eventually found. <laughs> now, in their mind, they think of the caravan as home from home. And I didn't know they had a caravan and I didn't know they were going to take the dog away in a caravan. Mm. So it is now on our intake assessment and on my personal assessment, do you own or go away in a caravan? Because yeah. what is logic in their head, this is home from home. They thought that would transfer to the dog. He was with them. He was in the caravan. They left the half door open and he took flight. Mm. As often happens with, with um, street yeah. dogs. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a funny one. You think you have every question covered. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was beating myself up over that one. <laughs> but who who would foresee the caravan with the half door open? Yeah. So it's yeah, yeah. And actually following that I wrote a piece for um we have a caravan and we're members of the caravan club, so I wrote a piece for them. <laughs> what to look out for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And can you talk about, so you have uh, about, about numbers here and percentages because, so you have basically an initial form and then you go and have a home check. Is that how it's? We do a home check, yeah. yeah. And that's how I started with Bedlington Rescue. Um, I did a couple of home checks. Um, yeah. And so the, the home check, um, whoever does the home check will have a behavior background. Okay. Um, which is unusual in rescue and it, it gives those of us with that um, qualification a heavy workload. <laughs> so every rescue is not, not going to be able to do that. So there, there is a home check. And um, so after the initial application, there's a phone call, <laughs> which is always good to do. It's, it's, it's good to, to talk to somebody rather than read, read descriptions on paper then there is the home check and then we will look at suitable dogs when we do an initial um introduction to the dog we would try and do it on neutral territory and um the the dog would meet the potential foster or or a doctor yeah. and um we, I, I don't think we have placed a dog yet that hasn't needed backup and support whether that be um gut health skin issues mm. in the main it is behavior mm. and can you talk about so with the initial form that you have the initial applications how many go through the second stage because i'm sure even from there there's a lot that don't go through after the first step I would say initially we had um, the applications maybe as high as 65%, okay. possibly because they were following us for a long time and they had owned the breed before um, and had a suitable setup at home. Okay. It has dropped off <laughs> lately. And um, I would say we're struggling with, with applications at the moment okay. where in terms of suitability and we have a lot of dogs who can only, who can need to be the only dog in the home. Mm -hmm. um, Multi-dog households, I think, are on the increase. Mm -hmm. And um, there are some breeds that just won't, won't work for us. And some dogs that we have available need to be solo dogs in the home. So I think, yeah, I, I think we're we're seeing different situations. And we definitely have a fallout after COVID where we had a lot of applications during COVID where people were at home. Mm -hmm. And now we have people, um, you know, where, where they're back at work. I think people are working harder. I think people are working longer hours. I, I see a lot of people saying, you know, um, I would have to do doggy daycare because I'm gone for 10 hours. So that's a long day. Mm -hmm. So something has shifted. Um, 
and we're we're not seeing the same the same success rate with with you know I I I'm struggling to get an application in where I say this sounds brilliant. There's there's always some factor that won't work. Okay. And you think it's a post COVID thing that can explain it? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I I I don't know. I mean, economically, countries have changed, mm-hmm. and I think um, I don't know whether employment situations have changed. But I see people saying. You know, honestly, how long will you be gone during the day, 10 hours? Well, we just can't work around that because even with daycare, um, we don't have dogs in the main who will be suitable for daycare. And how how long are you going to be home realistically with a rescue dog before you have to return to work? Are you going to sacrifice your annual holiday Mm -hmm. to stay at home with a rescue dog, acclimate them to your lifestyle? and then introduce them to daycare. I think that's a huge ask. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very hard to, to do, really. Yeah. yeah, and I feel sorry for, for applicants who, it's very hard to hear that, but in the long run, they're going to be experiencing a lot of stress themselves if yeah. they have a dog in that situation. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Now, for the, for the people who think in adopting a rescue dog or recently adopted maybe could you give i know we already covered that but what would be like the top three like tips that you would give them i think um well the main thing is is stick to that decompression period really give your dog time to have a low key chance to to settle in um if this, this thing about walls <laughs> is a huge thing. It is not necessary. Really, all that a dog needs in the initial stages is in and out of the house, toilet breaks, some enrichment and, and, and sniffing. Um, try to hold back your variable interactions. It can be overwhelming. We're I mean, it's it's for us, it's our main source of communication, but that's not what a dog wants. Mm. So sit back. Um, I would try to teach people if they're if they're actually physically interacting with a dog, just see what happens if you stroke the dog and then sit back. Does it come back? Does it say, mm. yeah, that was great. I, I, I'd like more. Does it do a shake off and say, I'm going off to self-soothe? Watch, you know, learn the dog body language and and watch what that dog needs. Make meal meal times predictable, make toilet breaks predictable. And one thing that um, we use a lot is multiple beds Mm. that the dog just doesn't have the bed in the corner of the kitchen or in the living room, that it has options where it can go into a room and, and it's, when you see it first introduced, it's like a sigh. They just go, oh, phew, there's one of those beds in the corner, <laughs> you know, because sometimes maybe the dog has had conflict around the sofa. Maybe it's been told it can be on the sofa. It, can, it can't be on the sofa. Um, and you don't, don't go into it in a kind of a, he has to know the rules. Mm. He he doesn't. Let's Let's just let the dog settle in and have lots of compassion for their situation that they're just learning. Um, We've had several adopters who um, have just started out saying, I'm going to sleep in the living room with the dog the first Mm -hmm. night. And we just go, wow, that's, you know, that's 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 usually what I do when I get a forced. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And you'll all get a night's sleep. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's, some stages, um, because I have a sport breed, I see it a lot with with my breed and I see it in different cultures where they're very tough on dogs. And we went through the stage of, um, oh, but that's just being, you know, letting the dog take charge. You know, all of that period where the alpha dog and all of the rest of that came in. Um, they have no interest in taking charge. They don't care about taking charge. They don't care about it or care for it. They just want to live in harmony with us. So we don't need that. Um, these are the rules of the house. What about 
um, telling the dog where they can go around the house and give them those multiple places to relax and rest. Yeah. And the one thing not to do, would you say walk? Would you? Would it be your first one, top one? I, I, well, yes, I think the... Uh, the whole human nature thing about we just got this dog, let's take them to Auntie Mary's, let's take them to the coffee shop, let's do this. Hold back on that mm. because that is not what a dog would be interested in. Let's look at it from how, how a dog feels. They're not interested in that. They want that that one-to-one -one human connection with you and hanging around, learning what happens in the house, learning you know the boundaries of the house you know where where those beds are where its food is where it goes for toilet breaks and and that predictability and my yeah I'm, <laughs> and up my my big thing is leave the walk because you are putting on a piece of equipment you're taking flight away from that dog and you're saying stay with me and and then I have had some video feedback that comes back and the dog is only a day in the house and he's brought to a curb and they said, sit, 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 sit. And the dog is just standing there like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm not a fan of sitting at the curb anyway, but when a dog has just arrived, can you imagine, you know, your first day in a new job and they say, do this, do this, do this we would just be a, a, a shaking mess but we think that dogs can have um commands they would be given to them and that they'll comply and it shouldn't be like that i mean really the purpose of a walk is what i'm doing out man trailing it's it's an olfactory experience it's getting all of those sniffs in that they can enjoy there, there's an overemphasis on the exercise benefits of walks over the emotional and sensory benefits of walks. Okay, yeah. And we have to get out of that. Yeah. yeah, true. What do you think the biggest misconception is when people think of, you know, adopting a rescue dog, I'm going to adopt a rescue dog, and they probably have expectation. And what do you think, you know, that a lot of things, I'd say, <laughs> Yeah, I I think the biggest misconception is that affection and love will overcome what's going on. Um, it's really important to work with the rescue and their knowledge and their expertise. And if they have behaviorists on board, um, it comes from a knowledge base that that they have and they're experts in what they're talking about. So as much as we have this lovely desire to nourish and show affection, we really need to put behavior programs and modification programs in place at times to help that dog um and affection and physical contact doesn't provide reassurance learning experiences will provide the reassurance so i think that's that's the the one thing that i see people hoping will will solve all the problems now i know we're going to have to talk about canine body language tomorrow but yeah. uh, you already mentioned a bit, you know, that they're um, trying to work, well, thinking of working about educating, you know, dogs and kids, basically. Can you give us a few tips about that and why it's so important as well, like for people to get educated and, yeah, and how to educate the kids and things like that? Yeah, the, the well, one one of the most important things with kids and dogs is, I think from day one, if parents will take the, the, the role of, of we're raising the dog together, but, but parents are in charge and will make decisions. Um, it isn't really okay to say um, a child is going to do exercise with a dog, a child is going to do feeding especially in the early days because, well, food being a resource, you don't want to get into that. You'll have been told by your rescue if there is a food res um, resource issue, but from day one, um, I think you, you 
need to start the education process with your child that look we will show you how to do things but work with 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 us in how we raise our dog um mm -hmm. not to allow the 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 constant contact that children will need to do and um, this is something that i've done myself and it's a bit it it can sound a bit daft it's like when parents bring a new baby into the house and the the baby brings a ho uh, a toy home or a special present for a sibling who's already in the home and, uh, and it, be it becomes this this story look what the baby gave you as a present i would get a big stuffed dog for a child who's who's too young to do their own impulse control mm -hmm. and teach them to hug that dog in place of the human dog when when or in place of the 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 life-size dog mm -hmm. in front of them. it when you have a child who's old enough to be into into arts and crafts um i like to get them to make a do not disturb sign themselves <laughs> You can get all the craft supplies out and they can draw their dog on it. They can do do not disturb. You know, you can help with the lettering, but they do all the glitter. They do all the gluing and they take the pride in putting that on mm. the crate or the dog area when the parents say this dog needs some downtime right now. That's so, amazing. yeah. <laughs> And it, it helps to let them do it and, and really make them part of it. I've also used um, success charts and, and star charts for the children because um, I've worked with some families who the, the kids are just, you know, they go through that stage where they're, they get attention by giving attention to the dog. So nothing happens until they interfere with the dog. Then everybody gets involved in a discussion, whether it's negative attention or not, it's happening. So giving them autonomy over how they work around the dog. And every time they come and say, um, you know, whatever, uh, mum, dad, I'm going to put the, I think, you know, scamp needs the do not disturb sign. Mm -hmm. A star goes on the chart for them for, for seeing that and for being observant. And then at the end of the week, they get a movie or pizza night or whatever. Make them part of... Um, thinking about their own behavior towards the dog and making them involved in a way where they're making decisions around the dog and they're working around the dog, but it doesn't involve brushing the dog, touching the dog, um, making the dog's bed, dressing the dog up, all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, supervision is really important and it's something that um, we used to talk about a lot in Family Paws parent education in the um, uptake in tablets and our phones and all these things that we have available to us, turning away and, and paying attention to somebody and the number of, statistically, the number of bites that happen at those times. Um, because the the parental supervision is 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 taken away mm. but you're really getting the child on board from day one so that it you know it tends to be don't touch the dog it's not going to work <laughs> it's it's a massive attraction to touch the dog but working with them around those those little things that they do themselves that get rewarded and that they get complimented for how brilliant they are at leaving their dog alone you know that's brilliant that's absolutely brilliant ideas absolutely yeah what would you what what would you say as the highest challenge for you like walking with the rescue dogs the biggest challenge mm. uh, the biggest challenge is is the compliance issue mm. okay. um we were talking about this earlier uh, that Paul had mentioned it with um, what is his rescue group called? Great Hounds in Need. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I was so thrilled he mentioned that the other day because um, you can sometimes feel like the baddie, mm. you know, talking about it and having to say to somebody who has taken on a dog and you've given them a programme and um, the one example of this was um, 
a dog who the first time I met her, she was out her her surrendering owner showed me how she does a walk with her and she crawled along the ground on her belly. She was absolutely terrified of walking. And this lady knew no better. She had taken on a behaviorist who hadn't helped her at all. And she ultimately surrendered the dog. So our instructions were that this was going to go very, very easy and no no big trips originally. And I was the, the person assigned to help them with it. And people forget about Facebook. <laughs> and we got a Facebook picture of this dog off lead on a beach. Right. And she was supposed to be at home settling in and doing very little of anything. Um, and that that kind of, you know, it, it, it looks really nice to take a dog to a beach, but she was a flight risk. How she didn't take off on them, I just don't know. And she was she was in a dreadful state from needing to have security and not be pressured into going on walks, you know? So compliance, I think is the most difficult thing. It's, it's difficult for taking on a dog, but if you just stick with us in the initial stages, when we're just working through a program, it comes from a place of our understanding of, of what a dog would need. And we've spent many years educating ourselves to get to that stage. So, you know, if, if an adopter works with us, we'll get there and we'll get there to a much better result. So yeah, compliance, I think is the toughest thing. <laughs> Anything else you would like to talk about or to add? Otherwise, we'll have a quick Q&A. I ask if anybody had any question, you can put them in the comments. But anything else you would like to add yourself? Um, I don't think so. I just, well, I, I think that I have had in, in my lifetime one dog who, who wasn't a rescue dog. And sometimes people will say well I've had I've had this rescue dog he came with this he came with that and there were loads of issues um my dog who I've raised from an eight-week-old puppy had lots of issues mm -hmm. it's she has fear issues um I know um was it Joe who spoke about it that there is a genetic component to that. There can be a genetic component to it. I think, it was, I think they both did actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she definitely falls into that category. So we we just we don't know. We don't know whether we're going to run into problems or not. Mm -hmm. And a lot of in a lot of cases, a rescue dog hasn't been surrendered because of behavior issues. And working with a good rescue, you get an idea of what that dog needs. I knew when I adopted Puck a year ago that he had been strayed at four months and there was a reason for that. He's working lines. He's a working line Belgian Shepherd. He's, okay. he's not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. um, and then he was in kennels for six months. So um, the, the chances were I was going to have uh, a crazy dog on my hands and man trailing has been phenomenal for him he is he's just outstanding at the sport mm. and it's so lovely to see him come home after that and be tired mm. yeah because <laughs> he doesn't do downtime very very well oh yes yes that's another thing we talk about is sleep right yeah the need for sleep mm. Um, we talk about it in our foster carers program. And when we say sometimes the requirements are up to 18 hours of sleep a day, people go, no, <laughs> no. But there are studies. Mm -hmm. there, there are studies. Um, people can look up the Italian study. It'll, it'll come up if they, if they look up that, um, where they studied dogs who had gone feral having lived in homes um yeah they rarely ran mm. they rarely hung out in groups mm. so that that begs the question of the relevance of dog yeah. parks yeah, yeah yeah and they slept for 
17 to 20 hours a day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So I'll see. If you have any questions, you can just type them in the comments. There's not any at the moment. Uh, do you have any update on the Mali that maybe you will get that you told me? Can you talk about that? I can't yet <laughs> because we have to we have to do a meet up. Um, one of the things that um, that surprises me about um, some of the bigger rescues, uh, some of the very well supported and funded rescues, and and I, I would be excluded from adopting a dog from them because one of their requirements is that you bring, if you're going to do um, a multi-dog household, that you bring your, your current dogs to the centre and meet the dog. I would be very opposed to that. Okay. My meetup would be very, very slowly at home. I've integrated four rescue dogs into the house here with absolutely zero issues. Um, mm -hmm. When Puck came to me, he was very young, very underweight, and he came to me intact so that he could grow emotionally and physically, and then we would neuter. Um, and he came into a household with two females, and I've never had one problem. If I had brought either of my females to one of the big rescues and gone into a room where everywhere around this building was arousal that my dogs were well aware of, it would not have gone well. Mm. So that's something that um, we need to think about. It's, it's, we need to do those introductions very nicely, very quietly and over time at home. So don't know how you get around that one. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's true. I, when I get a foster, I usually separate them the first few days. Just, I let them decompress first. So I don't want to add the stress of the other dogs or whatever. I just leave them in. Yeah, in a safe place, they get the routine there, they decompress there. And then eventually, slowly, I introduce them between baby gates, you know? Yeah. And because, yeah, it's, otherwise, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's just too much. Yeah, it is. And and it's quite funny. We, we so when Puck came into the household, there were two females, and sadly, we lost Cara a few months ago. So there's himself and Maddie, and, um, my daughter was asking, "Is has Puck gone downstairs to sleep with Maddie now? I said, no, they just sleep in their separate rooms. The doors have been open and they just go, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so that choice thing, they yeah. know they have choice of where to sleep. And it's mm -hmm. it's really nice. Yeah, they, they one is in the living room, one is in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> That's same it. Same here, same here. They all have their, yeah. <laughs> all have their, what they want, yeah. And some days they change it. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. Now we have a question, so I'm just going to read it to you. Okay. I have a three-year-old foster at the moment, a German Shepherd Wattweiler mix, and I have my own two-and-a-half-year-old Wattweiler. I'm spending a lot of time with him, currently training him up and getting him comfortable, but my own wants to be involved as well, which is a bit distracting, and she is getting jealous. What would you recommend to do? Good question. Yeah, I... I've always done kind of foundation training one-to-one -one with dogs because it's it's quite a skill. I can, if I'm doing established behavior, I can chuck three treats at one who's doing relax on a mat and train one, but I prefer not to train two together. So it's 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 a big time commitment from you, but separating them will mean less training and more results um in terms of the jealousy don't worry about your dog feeling jealous they it's it's our description of what jealous is is totally different to what a dog ex would experience what your dog may be missing out on is the resource of you or food from rewards and you can still work that in. It's not that your dog is saying, uh, mum is with that dog more. They they don't kind of compartmentalize things like that and think that way. It's That's a very human emotion. So just di dividing up things and then finding something that would work for both of them. And in most cases, that's a sniffy walk. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's something that can be done with, with both. 
um, where there isn't competition for those resources for for you or a reward. So good on you for doing the the training with your foster dog, mm-hmm. and I would uh, yeah I'd I'd separate them. So perhaps with if you're working with your foster dog, some something like a filled frozen con for your own dog, so that they have something to to work through while you're away, and um, classical music on in the background, a frozen con, and go off and work with a foster dog. That is how I do it. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah, I would never, I would, yeah. Usually rarely train two dogs at the same time as well because it's, yeah, it is complicated. It's difficult. Yeah. 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 I hope that I answer your question and see if I have, we have any other ones. Not at the moment. We'll wait a bit more. Otherwise, we'll just, uh, otherwise, you can just put, the question, especially if you're watching on replay, you can still put the, your question in the comments and Trish will come and see if there's anything more than she can help you with. Yeah. Uh, in terms of um, in terms of resources, um, there is a group here in the UK called Dog Centred Care. Okay. On Facebook, Andrew Hale heads that up. He is an absolutely wonderful trainer, um, very much into enrichment and choice, um, choice being very empowering for dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, um, that group is, is, is very good. And I've mentioned Sarah Fisher's ACE yes. group. And... Um, uh, a trainer who I've I've done some webinars with Shay Kelly here in the UK. He is a very funny, humorous uh, dog trainer. He's he's got a great sense of humor and a great look at what dogs need. And he's written a few books. Um, he has a master's in in canine behavior. Um, no, that's good. I'll, I'll look them up. Or, or maybe you can add them in the, in the comments as well. But yeah. as long as I will do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Yeah, it's 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 very rewarding. The the dogs that I've taken on in rescue, um, they've all been quite different and they've all had different um, issues. But putting the work in and you know. Puck is just, he's here beside me on the sofa and he's, he's not. He came, he came in the background there. Yeah. <laughs> he is an absolute pleasure to be around. Um, but I know what, I, what I'm doing with that breed. <laughs> they, they are not for the faint hearted. I know they're not. They're not. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. We have two, two more comments. So please, could you list all those resources? I didn't get them all written down, but I think I will. Yeah, we will. <laughs> so, and one more question. What about introducing a foster to cats when the foster loves chasing them? My cat isn't come home in two days if the foster is here. Oh, this is, um, this is very pertinent in our household. So we have a cat Thomas, who is 13 years old, and he came over from Dublin with us with three dogs. Yeah. At that time, when when I took Thomas on, I took him on for my mum, and I brought him home to my house en route to my mother's, and he walked in and said, oh, dogs. Not that he got access to them immediately, but I kept him because he is absolutely fantastic with the dogs. Mm-hmm. But he's had a, a, a really wonderful relationship with, with dogs. The rescue that Puck came from had a cattery and they weren't very experienced with his breed. Um, they told me that he had been cat tested and he was good with cats. So it was a bit of a I traveled seven hours to pick him up, so I couldn't bring my, I couldn't do anything about the introductions, and it was a desperate situation. So I pretty much decided I could work with him. He would kill my cat if he got to him. 
So our situation at home with with Puck is that I will never introduce him to Thomas. Okay. <laughs> it it's not going to happen. It just cannot happen. I've never seen a dog so obsessed. When I first got him, he would scan under cars. And th so there will be no introduction. And mm -hmm. that's my decision about Thomas. Thomas still has access to the other dogs, but sadly he hasn't mm -hmm. wanted access to them as much as he did. He can tell when we're getting out of the van with Puck rather than Maddie. And mm -hmm. if it's Maddie, he'll hang around. He doesn't come and say hello to her outside. But if it's Puck, he's gone. Yeah. You know? this book so i i won't i won't introduce um i won't introduce puck to thomas that is not going to happen and i think your if your cat has taken off at this stage if your cat comes back i think the the separation thing has to be done i describe our house at the moment as like living in a submarine <laughs> With those two doors, the two the barrier doors, it's very difficult. It is there's there's my husband and myself in the house that we we have conversations and we phone each other. Is the door closed? Is this door closed? Is this door closed? So far, we've gone through a year of this and kept things safe. <laughs> yeah, good. You're pretty much used to it, I'm sure. By this stage, we are. But it is a massive commitment. <laughs> and what has happened is Thomas has, a, our house is over four levels. Um, so he has adapted and he stays in the bedrooms and in the converted loft. He doesn't go into the living room anymore, which is really sad, but it is what it is. I know that I can't do anything about that. Your cat will never accept, so for, for the person asking the question, your cat is very unlikely to accept an introduction and would, you know, if your cat, if the foster dog is chasing your cat, it's mm -hmm. not going to happen and it's, it would not be ethical to present a cat and hold it in a restrained hold and say to this dog, here, here's my cat. It, I think you are possibly going to have to accept that it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And when that dog goes on, if it if it leaves you and goes for adoption, I would say that for for your expertise as a fosterer to pass on the information that this dog shouldn't be rehomed with cats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Puck's prey drive is off the scale about squirrels and all of those other things as well. So cats are just in that category to him. I have no doubt that that it has come from the, the, the life that he lived before I had him because his behavior of scanning under cars, it, it's a learned behavior. He's, he's got a thing about cats. Yeah. So I, I can't take that risk. I love Thomas very much, but it's tough. It's very tough. So I would say really, really let your cat know that, that it's secure and limit access in the home. If you know there are places where your cat likes to be, I wouldn't let your, your foster dog in those areas. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, it's a tough one. It's a tough mm. one. Yeah. At least it's not um, at least it's not a forever dog yet. So hopefully yeah. the cat can, can have the freedom back. Yeah. 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 Definitely pass pass it on to the rescues that uh, yeah, it's not cat free. Yeah. Yeah, it's important information that you can feed back to them. And, and I would definitely say that dog needs to be classed as cannot be rehomed with cats. It was missed out on on um, on the information with Puck um, because I don't know what the cat test. They said they brought him in and he <laughs> he looked at cats. I don't know. He looked at it and he didn't share them then. No. Yeah, yeah. But, okay. But, <laughs> you know the 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 dog cat integration thing is is difficult at the best of times yeah, yeah. so um yeah i don't think my husband's very impressed with that with that outcome but it happens there are some dogs who just won't won't work yeah i have one of those like i don't have a cat thank god but when he sees one even outside he goes completely ballistic and yeah. just like you i believe because he was a rescuer he was five or six when i had him I do believe that it comes from a bad experience in the past. I'm not because he go he, he loses his mind like completely. You know, it's not, you know, I've seen dogs chase cats and stuff like that, but he completely loses his mind. 
Yeah. There, there is a reason. I don't know. But I don't know it. So I'll never get it. So which far. one of your dogs is that? It's uh, the German Shepherd Lab. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not, not, not a typical cat chaser, really. No, no. It's, but he goes like, it's, like, you should hear him. Like, if we are outside and he sees a cat, I'm sure my neighbors do believe that I'm torturing my dog. Because he he start like he completely loses his mind, you know. Wow. Yeah. So, but yeah, it was since day one, and it never changed. So I believe there's an antecedent or past, like just not aware of. But I'm yeah. not sure I will never get a car because that it could be different inside. But I'm not going to take a chance. I'm, I'm just not, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you have that behavior and it's it's displayed to that degree. There is no teaching and no integration that you can do with that because that cat is prey, mm. Mm. you know, and it's and and no cat will hang around, nor should they, <laughs> and and say, yeah, I think I might fancy an introduction to this dog. It's tough. I have when we had Maddie as as an eight week old puppy, um, and the crate was out all the time and hadn't been out for uh, several years, maybe every one of our dogs wanted to be in the crate they just thought it was the best place ever and i have a photograph of a collie a jack russell a belgian shepherd pup a belgian shepherd adult and a cat in the crate <laughs> and it is the most gorgeous picture but it was when thomas went in at the end i was like what <laughs> It was the place to be, that crate. Yeah. But Thomas used to, he, he's also, he's lost his, his, his two dogs that he hung out with mostly, the Jack Russell and the Collie. So life was changing anyway. But um, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. And, and this, this person asking the question has said, same just behavior as you're describing. With yeah. So it's, yeah, you, you just, it's, there's no coming back from that really it's a tough one yeah okay so i think if there's no more question we'll probably wrap it up <laughs> okay and if there's any more after if you watch on replay again you can just post them in the comments and we will do our best to catch up with everything <laughs> And yeah, we, we'll post those um, those Facebook groups and those resources. They're they're very useful for for rescue dogs. Yeah, absolutely. Do thank you so much, Trish. That was okay. really interesting. Oh. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Have a good evening. Yeah, and I'll see you again, people, in about thirty minutes. <laughs> Yeah, and, and if anybody can find um, a nice house for me in Ireland, because we're moving back in about eight weeks' time, we haven't found a house yet. Eight weeks? Oh, my God. Okay, good luck with that. Find me a house with, with an acre in Roscommon for my Belgian Malinois. <laughs> for sale or for rent? Because for sale. For sale. sale. Okay, well, if anybody knows, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you no. know there's one here. It's not in Roscommon, but there's one in my village. I'm not joking. There is actually, but this it's it's, it's not five acres, no. Yeah. <laughs> one acre, one acre will do me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Good. Thank to you so much, Trish. Bye. Bye.